In this recording, we're going to pick up where we left off in the live webinar looking at accounting regulation. So remember, there's two aspects to this, accounting regulation theory, and we looked at that in the live webinar around the different theories around who benefits from accounting regulation. Public interest, private interest, the capture theory of regulation. What we're now going to look at in this recording is the, in practice, well, what does regulation look like currently? And we're looking at the four different sources, company law, the regulation from the accounting profession, international influences, in particular international accounting standards, and then finally the stock exchange. So the first core one, of course, is company law, because in company law in Ireland requires the directors of limited companies must prepare financial statements, and those financial statements must give a true and fair view. So that's the foundation in terms of why companies prepare financial statements, because it's a legal requirement. And if you don't do that, you will be breaching your director duties under company law. Now, the framework on which you can prepare your financial accounting standards, there is a choice. You can either use IFRS, which is your international financial reporting standards, and they're the ones you would have covered briefly last year, and we're going to cover in semester two as well. So your IAS 16, your IFRS 15, all those international standards. But if you're a smaller company, and you may not feel, actually, I don't think I need to prepare international accounting standard based financial statements. You have what we call Irish and UK GAP, generally accepted accounting principles or practices. These are issued by the Financial Reporting Council in the UK. So the company law allows a choice. You can either prepare IFRS or you can prepare Irish and UK GAP. And what company law sets out then is which companies have to do one or the other. So for example, if you're a listed company, so you're listed on the stock exchange, you have to use IFRS. So you have to use it by law, international financial reporting standards. So there is a company law, the new company law in 2017, Companies Act Accounting, that gave, I suppose, force to a lot of these changes. It tells you what each type of company is. So we talk about micro companies, small companies, medium and large companies. And I have given you a PDF of that. I don't expect you to know it off by heart, but I expect you to have a decent appreciation that company law dictates what accounting requirements each type of company has. And the bigger the company is, the more accounting requirements they have. The logic of that is if you're a small company, it'd be very onerous to get you to do international accounting standards for everything. So they streamline it down to have less disclosure requirements and less accounting requirements the smaller a company is. Right? So just bear that in mind. And that's all driven by company law. So as in practice, you have a choice, Company Act, individual accounts. These are driven by the company's law itself, and they will be under financial reporting standards with no I, FRS. So they are what's known as UK and Irish GAP. Right? For other companies, then you can use IFRS accounts, international financial reporting standards. But the vast majority of companies in Ireland would use these under UK and Irish GAP. Now, it's not that they're a million miles away in terms of difference, but generally the Companies Act accounts will be less detailed than IFRS. Now, if you go and you look at the annual report of Glombia, or you look at the annual report of Greencore or Ryanair, that would be IFRS because they're listed companies on the stock exchange. But if you go and look at a private limited company that's not listed in the stock exchange, you will most likely see them prepared under FRS, Financial Reporting Standards. Right? So again, that's the EU regulation. All listed companies must use IFRS. Right? Now, the Company Act accounts, as I mentioned, this is UK and Irish gap. So actually, UK and Irish generally accepted accounting principles. They are set in the UK by an entity called the Financial Reporting Council. So that means if you're not big, a very big company or you're not listed in the stock exchange, you can use a simplified version of accounting standards, the generally accepted accounting principles. And they are covered in FRS 100 to 105. You don't need to know what's in them. You just need to have an appreciation that there's two choices. You can use IFRS if you wish, but if you don't feel you need to, or you feel it would be too onerous for your business, you can use FRS as well. And they are called Irish Gap. Right, so that's just a short summary. I said, don't worry too much. You won't be asked what's in them, but you may come across them next year again when you get to final year. Uh, the majority of limited companies in Ireland will use, will use FRS 100 to 102. 
that's a core framework only the biggest companies in ireland and the list of companies will use ifrs but i said frs 100 to 102 that is the kind of a summarized version of ifrs they're still based on the same principles but it's just more streamlined and it's less onerous and your IFRS accounts are set by the International Accounting Standards Board. And these are the ones that we're going to cover uh, in our lectures. So the likes of all the IESs, the International Accounting Standards, and the new IFRSs, they all fall under IFRS accounts. IFRS being the new name for the standards. So again, in addition to your accounting, the Companies Act 2014 gives you the main requirements. So you must prepare profit or loss of balance sheet, director's report, and auditor's report. So you must get the company audited unless you have an exemption. And there can be some exemptions depending how big you are. And then there's other filing reports, etc., administration. So the Company Act, as well as setting out the accounting requirements, they will set out the administration requirements as well. Because remember, one key thing about a limited company is there's much more regulation than being a sole trader. So you don't need to know it in detail. You will cover that in later law modules. But just have an appreciation. Law provides the basis for what accounting, um, the accounting requirements in companies. So Companies Act in particular is the main one. The accounting profession itself also provides a regulatory framework. So we know up until 1970s, we talked about in the live webinar, very little regulation, if anything. However, then the accounting professional bodies, and there's different ones, particularly in the UK, uh, they all came together to come up with this accounting standards steering committee. So they're trying to come up with some standard set of um, accounting principles that they can apply across each of their clients. So the first precursor of this was the ASSC. So they were trying to limit the choice and methods so you get some comparability and to improve the standards. So it was very basic, but it was the first attempt at coming up with a consistent set of accounting standards. Right? It was renamed then Accounting Standards Committee in 1976. And subsequently, if we come back here, I come on, it was renamed then coming back up to the Financial Reporting Council in 1990. And that is where it's at today. It's UK based, but it sets the accounts for Ireland as well. So you're coming back from 1970 to the ASSC, then the ASC. And this was the accounting bodies who, who came up with this. So it's the professional bodies came together to come up with a common set of standards. Right? The problem was there was a lack of enforcement. There wasn't a regulatory power. These were just coming up with concepts. They're coming up with standards. But there was no legislative backing to actually enforce them. So what the development had to be and what led to the uh, creation of the Financial Reporting Council was the need for clarity, the need for enforcement and the need for more stricter regulation. So the Deering Committee came up and they said we need to improve Ireland and UK standard setting processes and they came up with a recommendation among other things to position the standards in company law so it's clear where they fit in and we've discussed that in terms of how they fit in to company law in Ireland and also to come up with the Financial Reporting Council. So these are the regulators of accounting in the UK. But if you look at them here, the frc.co.uk, the Financial Reporting, look at it here, the Financial Reporting Council, it's a UK-based organisation, but they are regulators for accountants, actuaries and auditors in the UK, but they also prepare financial reporting standards. Now they call them the UK accounting standards. We use them in Ireland as well. I'm going to talk about the standards in issue and they'll tell you about the accounting framework. So it's a it's a nice it's a nice easy read if you're interested in one of those uh, the standards in issue but just have an idea of what the Financial Reporting Council does. It creates the standards that are used in UK and Ireland if you don't use international accounting standards. So the international IFRS standards are the pinnacle, the most detailed and therefore the biggest companies. If you feel you don't need that or it to be too onerous, then you will use the standards set by the Financial Reporting Council. And they use the Accounting Standards Board and the Financial Reporting Review Panel. That's the watchdog that implements it. That is in the UK. 
In Ireland, we have our own watchdog called IASA. Right? Remember, we talked about that in the live webinar, the Irish Auditing and Accounting Supervisor Authority. So that's UK only. In Ireland, we have an equivalent to that, but it's a separate entity. And the Auditing and Accounting Supervisory Authority. Their role is to regulate the auditors, supervise them, and to supervise the financial reporting of the largest companies in Ireland, i.e. the listed companies. So FRRP is in the UK, IASA is in Ireland. And you can see what they're, they're responsible for. They're responsible for examining financial reporting of listed companies, supervising PAB as the accounting bodies, how they regulate their members, oversight of the, how the professional bodies regulatory functions work, and inspecting the audit of public interest entities, such as your listed companies. So they have a big and wide mandate in Ireland. They're essentially, they look at financial reporting, they look at auditing, and they look how the professional accounting bodies run. And they play a key role. And all of their publications, all of their decisions are published on their website as well. So if you go to iasta.ie, you will see it tells you all about them and it also publishes all their information. So if they have a judgment against a company or if they have a judgment against a, for example, a professional body, it'll be published there. So it gives, again, public perception that there is been supervisory authorities and there is been regulation in the professional bodies because you want because society is putting a reliance on these financial statements they want to make sure they're being prepared accordingly and supervised accordingly All right so they are the pabs in ireland the professional accountancy bodies the main ones and you'll see this in the profile of the profession where the main numbers are will be acca the Associ association of chartered certified accountants icai chartered accountants ireland and sema Chartered Institute of Management Accountants. And you will see in the profile of the profession that I've put up, I ask to produce this every year. It tells you how many qualified accountants are in Ireland, their age, their occupation, their gender split, and it does the same for students. So that can be helpful, particularly for next year when you're deciding what accountancy path am I going to take? Am I going to be a management accountant? And am I going to be a financial accountant? Which professional body am I going to train with? You can get a lot of information from that profile or profession to see what the split is and where the trends have been over the last number of years. Right. International influences, well, number one is EU law. EU law now dictates why IFRS is mandatory for listed companies, and that came in in 2005. As well as that, you have the International Accounting Standards Board, which sets the international financial reporting standards. So these guys are away from the Financial Reporting Council. The financial Reporting Council just deals with UK and Ireland. But for the international standards that are used right across the world, there's an independent body. It is based in the UK, but it is separate. Uh, and we've seen most countries in the world, bar two main exceptions, China and the United States, will use international accounting standards. China and the US themselves have their own independent set of standards. Some of them will be similar enough to the international financial reporting standards, but there can be key differences as well. All right. What's nice about the international accounting standards is they actually tell you how a standard is developed. So if you go to ifrs.org and we go it here, they talk you through the steps they go through in developing a new standard. So they talk you through, for example, how they set the agenda, the research program that they undertake in terms of researching what the problems are in certain entities. How they, how they set a standard, how they look for consultation, how they, ex, they release a draft standard and look for feedback and update that standard as well. And finally, once the standard is implemented, they look at a maintenance program. They look at, is there any issues that pe companies are having with this particular standard? Do we need to issue interpretation guidance or do we need to do a review of it once it is implemented to make sure it is being successful? And a very interesting aspect of this IFRS and International Accounting Standards Board sits within IFRS is they tell you the research projects that are currently undertaking. So, for example, look at all the research projects that are currently being undertaken. Updating a maintenance project in IAS 8. So MP stands for maintenance project. They're looking at another maintenance project in IAS 12. 
dealing with taxation. They're thinking, for example, here, if you look at SP, they're thinking of setting a standard for management commentary. How do management comment on the financial statements in an annual report? They're setting about new standard for primary financial statements. It's currently in its feedback or an exposure draft uh, format, which is due for feedback in 2020. So there's a huge amount of projects being undertaken, which is going to change a lot of the accounting standards. Some of those projects are research, i.e. really at the initial stage, figuring out that we need a standard or not. Some of them are developed onto setting a standard and they're giving draft standards and looking for feedback. And some of them are at maintenance. They're really just uh, improving current standards, small interpretation issues uh, to make sure it's as clear as possible for those stakeholders who use uh, the IFRS standards. But that's something that'll be interesting. Go to IFRS, go to projects and look at their work plan because these are going to be the new standards when you go onto the workplace that are going to be implemented. All right. To give you an example of the timeline, if you look at the completed projects, go to IFRS, projects completed, two of the most recent completed projects, which are now implemented, are IFRS 15 on revenue and IFRS 16 on leases. And if you actually go into one of those, take for example leases, you can see the project history and you can see all the feedback, all the draft documents, all the submissions and lobbying on behalf of the accounting firms and big companies uh, that how this leases, com leases standard was developed. It was released in 2016 and it became effective on the 1st of January 2019. So it's now in effect. But if you look at the history, which is the interesting aspect, look how long it took to be developed. Some people might say yeah, it might take two or three years. This project developed initially started in 1996 with a proposal. That took 10 years to get a discussion paper. That then took another year or so to get feedback on the discussion paper. Then another year to get a draft. Then another year to get feedback on that draft. And you can see all the feedback if you click into it. Another two years to get a revised draft. And then finally the standard was published around 2016. So a huge amount of time goes in to developing new standards to get it as accurate as possible. Like if you go back again, um, we can go back here to, for example, ifrs.org, and we look at completed projects. Let's look at IFRS 15, which is revenue, and we look at the project history. You can see all the history of the meetings as well. This started back, it was effective in 2019, it started all the way back 2002, setting the agenda. It took four years to get on the agenda, then a discussion paper, a draft, a revised draft, and finally the standard was in 2014. But it still wasn't implemented until 2016-2017. So again, it's a hugely drawn out process and it's hugely political because you can see all the feedback. Look at all the consultation feedback that happens. So for example, if we look at here in 2011, they look for feedback on the revised draft. You can actually see all the letters that were submitted. View the comment letters. So all of these companies or all of these entities submitted an application or uh, an opinion on what the draft standard was. So Apple submitted one. Let's open up Apple's. You can actually see the document, the letter they sent. They sent this to the International Accounting Standards Board about what their opinion was. Let's see also PwC sent a letter the International Accounting Standards Board. This was their opinion on what they were happy with or what they weren't happy with. 20 pages long. That's only one submission. If you go to the end, just for that revised draft alone, if we go to the last page, 357 submissions. These can be big four firms, big accounting firms. They can be small firms. They can be big multinationals, Telefonica, Cisco, the Australian Accounting Board. Hewlett Packard, Pfizer, but they all have their own opinion what way the new revenue standard should be submitted. And the nice thing is you can click in and actually see it. It's very transparent, but it's also very political. So that's why it takes so long for accounting standards to be developed is it has big impact because this impacts companies right throughout the globe. And those were two huge standards, big changes in 
international financial reporting, accounting for revenue recognition, and accounting for leases. All right. So there's pros and cons of having international accounting standards. It does, again, help to raise capital in foreign markets because there's consistency, right? there's comparability across financial reporting, and it just it reduces time because then you don't have to start learning 15 different types of international accounting standards because the markets are becoming more global. You have more global multinational companies, more global capital markets. It makes sense. But unfortunately, not all countries are signing up to it. And some people are quite adamant that there is limitations. There's different legal systems. There's different views of who financial reporting should adhere to. The shareholder view versus, for example, the stakeholder or tax view. And there is a big thing around the threat to nationalism. So, for example, the whole idea of the United States, they haven't accepted international financial reporting standards because there's a, there's a power element to that as well, a political element, that if they do agree to this, maybe they will no longer be seen as the center or the home uh, of global capitalism. So, again, there is there is huge political issues at play as well. But from what I showed you earlier, and I'll show you again here in the IFRS, if you come back to us and we look at who we are around the world, and you look at the map, down here the map should be shown somewhere. And we look at who uses IFRS for public companies. Most of the world is highlighted. With the exception of the United States, African countries, India and China, everywhere else is using it. Right? I think Japan is another obviously exception, it's a big company. All Europe, mandated by EU law, Canada, Right, Brazil, South Africa, Australia, New Zealand, right, Russia, all of those big companies and big countries to the say, big entities are using it. But there is still politics at play. And to get global convergence is proving quite, quite tricky. They are trying, but it is quite a slow burner. And finally, then, if you are a listed company, and you are trading your shares on the stock exchange, whether it's the Irish Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, or New York, each of those will have their own rules. Most of the rules will revolve around international accounting standards, but they'll also have their own particular reasons or particular rules that they will acquire. So for example, they'll set requirements about uh, listing of securities, right? They'll be monitoring compliance with particular regulations, whether that's disclosure information, insider trading, disclosure of valid news. So there's a huge amount of responsibility when you list on a stock exchange. So this is not relevant if you're a private limited company. This is only relevant if you want to list your shares on a public market. You can list them in Ireland and the Isaac. You can list them in London on the London Stock Exchange, or you could even go to New York and the New York Stock Exchange. So there's plenty of choice, but just note that is an important source of regulation as well, over and above company law and the other ones we've talked about. Right. And there's plenty of responsibilities there, particularly around insider trading. You cannot trade on information that's not available in the public domain. So what I want you to take away from this extra recording is the core aspects or the core sources of regulation for accounting. I don't expect you to know company law in detail. I don't expect you to know the listing requirements in the Irish Stock Exchange, but I expect you to have a broad appreciation of the four sources, the timelines involved in developing new standards, and also the pros and cons or the advantages and disadvantages of having a global set of accounting standards. Because not everyone agrees that we should have a global set, but there are pros and cons. So there's plenty of textbooks there that are available if you want to read up on this. And there's a question pack six, and the solution to that question pack is up on loop as well, that will help you cover this area. It is one of the choices in your continuous assessment, so certainly you may choose this. And remember what I showed you in the live webinar, have a look at the Financial Times and follow the accountancy tag, because a lot of those stories are regulatory focused, where there's been accounting fraud, there's accounting scandals, and ultimately that is where there's breaches of regulation. All right, so that finishes our semester one, finishing accounting regulation, theory and practice. And we'll see you all back in semester two uh, to continue on AC220. Thank you very much.